Praise the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus. I hope you all picked up on that tune. Amen. And uh, praise God, praise God. Well, God is good, isn't he? God is good all the time. And all the time is God good. And so, praise the Lord. Good to have you all here tonight on Wednesday night and here at our services. And let me take just a moment to welcome all of you that are watching by way of Rumble. Uh, live with us here in the auditorium tonight, Wednesday evening uh, Bible study as we Wednesday night in the Word. And so good to have you with us. Thanks for joining with us and letting us come into your home and study the Word of God together. And uh, those of you that are on Facebook as well, God bless you and thanks for tuning in with us and being with us. Let me encourage you to take your Bibles and get your Bibles open to Second Chronicles chapter 16. Second Chronicles chapter 16 going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 tonight, and a little different for you, a little different for me tonight. But Second Chronicles uh, 16, uh, going into the Old Testament tonight, and we're going to take a, a quick look at King Asa and all that he was involved with and his reign and some of the things that went on and didn't go on and should have gone on and uh, try to relate it to us today uh, as we take a look at what's going on as we talk about the blessings of God. I think everyone in here wants the blessings of God. We really, I mean, I think you really do. I believe you want to be blessed and you want God to bless you and to bless you as individuals, to bless your marriage, to bless your family, to bless your home, to bless your business, to bless the church. I don't know of any believer that doesn't want to be blessed. And may I say right off the bat, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless each and every one of you in your homes, your marriages, your family, our church. God wants to bless us. And the only thing that withholds that is us. Okay? The blessings are there and they're available. If you study the Word of God long enough and heard it preached long enough and been around long enough, you'll discover that the majority of the blessings come through obedience in the Scripture. The majority of God's promises come through obedience. And you'll also learn that most of His promises and blessings are conditional. Okay, they're conditional. God says this and does this and so forth, back and forth. All the way through the whole life of the nation of Israel, everything was conditional almost with them, that God with them. But, I mean, uh, promises and blessings are conditional. For instance, train up a child, right, in the Lord, and then what's that? That's just the condition. If you'll train the child up when he's in the Lord, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. See, there's the promise, but there's the condition. See, the condition is you've got to train up the child. And the promise will be, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And you can go on and on with so many different challenges and when it comes to blessings and promises in the Word of God that they are based on much on obedience, our obedience, and, uh, and the challenges that God sets before us uh, are conditional. God says if you uh, obey, do, so forth and so on, then He will do and so forth and so on. But He also told the nation of Israel, if you don't, I'm going to do this. And, and God always comes through with His Word. He's faithful with His Word. But I want to try to share something tonight with you uh, to where, show you in the Word of God where you can be guaranteed blessings for life. Guaranteed blessings for life. As we take a look at this passage of Scripture, and uh, before we get into it, I'm going to kind of read uh, my handwritten outline for you tonight, or introduction, if you'll allow me to. All right? Uh, we're told uh, many times in the Scripture to give thanks in and for everything. Everybody agree with that? Say amen. And sometimes, because God has blessed us so much, uh, we become spoiled. I mean, we're spoiled people. We really are. Uh, sometimes we literally take it for granted. The blessings of God. And so, all, all, and although we serve a wonderful God who wants to bless us, amen? So tonight we're going to try to look at a, a passage here, and in particular, verse 9 is my text verse, that will guarantee the blessings of God in and on your life, all right? It is a conditional passage. It's a matter of fact, uh, most of the promises in the Bible are conditional. Blessings as well. And I gave you an example there. There's a couple of others that we could give as examples. For instance, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, when you get to verse 10, God says to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. See, there, here's the, 
Here's the conditional. And then he says, see if I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessings that you can't contain. So if you want the blessings from God that you can't contain, you got to bring the tithes in the storehouse. Amen. See, there's the condition. And over in the New Testament, we get to Luke 6, 38, and we have another uh, command even. Uh, we have an action verb that's it's in the present tense. It's a command. God says, give. See, that's, that's our, here's the condition. And then he says, and it shall, there's the promise, be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. So there we have again, there's the conditional. And so some people say, well, I'm not. Well, maybe because you're not meeting the condition. See, sometimes we, we, we look at folks and we wonder, say, wow, pastor, I've been living for the Lord and, I, and I, I'm, I'm teaching and I'm working and singing and preaching and handing out tracts and everything. It just seems like a, the blessings are coming. And then I look at some others and see, you shouldn't compare yourself, but uh, we do sometimes. And you say, they say they're saved and know the Lord, and, but they observe by, through observation and they don't look like they're living too much for the Lord, amen, and, and so forth. And yet God seems to be blessing the socks off their feet. And and I go through this many times in counseling and people ask me and, and they say, what's the answer to that? And I said, well, there's one thing you have to keep in mind. There is a God of this world and he's called the devil. There is the prince of the power of the heirs. It calls, uh, he's called the devil. The devil can bless you. Man, there's a lot of people who have sold their soul to the devil and he promises and gives them the world but only to wind up in hell later, you see. And so then sometimes I tell them, well, you've got to keep this in mind. The Bible says that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. Amen. So sometimes God's blessing folks for he's trying to get their attention and turn them around and get them coming back to him. So these are things. And in other ways, when you're living like that and you're wondering and say, well, then you've got to examine your own heart. Amen. And you've got to see if your heart's in tune and right with the Lord. Isn't that what David said? David said, Lord, search me, O God, and search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Then he said, God created me a new heart and a renewed spirit in me. And so, you know, and the Bible says that God looketh on the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance. Everything comes from the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The Bible says if we believe in our heart. So you see, everything comes from the heart. So the blessings are going to come as we take a look at it tonight. So we're going to continue on here in verse 9. We'll take a look at it there. But uh, uh, you see, in verse 9, I want you to read it, and then we'll make some comments, and we're going to get back to it here. Look at verse 9. Here's my text verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. I mean, believe that. Matter of fact, that phrase is found 22 times in the Bible. 21 in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, all right? So you can look it up later. So what is he doing that for? To show himself strong in the behalf, and here it is, here's the condition, this is a conditional passage of blessing, of them whose heart is perfect toward him. There's the key to the whole thing. There's the key to having the guaranteed blessings of your life and my life is God's eyes are going to and fro on the earth looking for someone that he can show himself strong in, you see, whose heart is perfect toward him. In other words, God wants everybody to know he is God. And God wants to use you and I to do something strong and mightily in us whose hearts are perfect before the Lord, toward the Lord, so that he can show to everybody that he is God. Because he wants everybody to know he's God. And what a, what a joy to know that. And when that takes place, you'll see the blessings that come from it are, are just tremendous as we take a look at the story here uh, tonight. So God wants, uh, uh, it's, it's through the person whose heart's perfect toward him, uh, God wants to show, demonstrate his power, his goodness, and remind everyone that he is God. So God is looking for those whose heart are perfect towards him. And so that's the guarantee I'll read a few other passages here. You can write them down. In Proverbs, here's some of those 22 times. In Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Job 34, 21, almost the same thing. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Jeremiah 32, 19 says this, Great in counsel 
and mighty in work, speaking of God. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. All right, so we got that. There's a condition. To give, here we go, here's the blessing, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So there's a couple wonderful passages of Scripture that help us with this evening. So let's uh, read this a little bit uh, here, and we're going to come back. And as you notice in your outline tonight, you have all the answers. So you see, this is to help you go through it right quick so I can get to what I want to get to. So the outline is to kind of give you that clue of what's going on in these 11 verses. And, and we'll, we'll go through that help. But in Second Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 through 11, it says, In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. Now, Basha is the king of Israel, of Israel, okay, so that's the northern kingdom, all right? And Asa is the southern kingdom, all right? So you keep that in mind, all right? And, and he came up and he built a Ramah there to, to the intent. Now, here's why the king of Israel built this. He, in other words, he wanted to put up some walls. He wanted to make some boundaries, okay? Uh, and, and so, he, 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 so and here's why. So he might let none go out or come in. Now, he didn't want anybody going out. He didn't want any of the northern kingdom going to the southern, and he didn't want any of the southern coming to the north, okay? Into the king of, of Judah, so then Asa brought out silver and gold of the treasury of the house of the Lord and of the king's house, and he sent to Ben-Hadad, and, and king of Syria. Now we're getting into king of Syria here. Who dwelt at Damascus, saying, now you've got to understand the king of Ben-Hadad, he was uh, in alliance with uh, Basha's uh, dad, daddy. They were in alliance, but they were enemies with each other and enemies of Jerusalem. And so there's a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break the league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And so and Ben-Hadad uh, hearkened unto the king Asa, and he sent the captains of his armies against the city of Israel. And they smote Ijon and Dan and Abelman and all the store of Naphtali, of the cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Basha heard it that he left off the buildings of Ramah, there or Ramah, and let his work cease. So the king, he decided he's going to stop the work because he got defeated in the battle. Then Asa, uh, the king, took all of Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha uh, was building, and he built Derev, Geba, and Mesbah. And at the, at, the, at the time of Haniah, the, the seer, that's the prophet of God, he came to Asa, king of Judah, and he said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, your enemy, it was what he was, and not relied on the Lord, thy God therefore uh, is the host of the king of Syria, escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubans a, a, a huge host, and every man's chariot and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely uh, on the Lord, he delivered them into thy hand when you did. For the eyes of the Lord, and this is the prophet of God telling the king of Asa, you messed up. Okay? There was a time when you went to the Lord. There was a time when you relied on the Lord. There was a time when you depended on God. There was a time when you asked God, and he gave you victory over the Ethiopians and the, and the other group there, uh, there, and gave you great defeat. But now, ten, over ten years have passed, and now you face this problem with the northern king, and you've made an alliance. Matter of fact, he bribed uh, the, the, his enemy. See, folks, it's never wrong, uh, right to do wrong or right to do wrong. And what he did, he did wrong trying to justify the means, you see. And God was not pleased with it. And so God, and so the prophet tells the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Now listen to what the prophet tells Asa here. And by the way, Asa reigned 36 years, and we have it recorded that he did good, which was in the sight of the Lord. All right? And the other one, the, the northern king, he was no good. He was a bad, wicked king. He was a rotten king, man. He, he did everything. You don't even talk about that guy. Then Asa was wroth with the seer. In other words, seer is another word for prophet, one who sees things and foretells it. And put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and the, and the last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So that gives you a little idea of what's going on. 
and what's happening. So let's take a look at it for just a minute, and then I want to get into sharing some things with you, all right? So we have here, we notice that Asa was the king of Judah, and the scripture tells us he was a good king, all right? And Basha, he was the king of Israel. Well, he was an evil king. I mean, he led the people into all kinds of stuff and idolatry and, 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 and spiritual adultery and paganism. And I mean, oh, he, would, and he didn't want any of the, and what was going on, Judah was at least trying to live for God and worship the Lord the way they were supposed to. So a lot of the people from the northern kingdom wanted to go down to Judah and worship uh, with them down there. So that's why he built what he did to stop that because he didn't want that to happen. He didn't want that to take place. And so Asa said, well, we're not going to have this. So he goes and finds a, a, the enemy, a, a, a Damascus there of Syria, the king, and says, I'm going to pay you and bribe you with gold and silver, and I want you to go to defeat his armies and do something about this. Well, that's exactly what happened. The king Asa bribes the Assyrians to attack. Now, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is what he was saying here. Now, the end does not justify the means. Can I get an Amen. The end does not justify the means. See, he did something wrong, you see, and even though it turned out right for him in the victory, God was not pleased with it and was not satisfied with it. See, God is able to be strong for his loyal people. Okay? The human heart is desperately wicked. David tells us that. So King Asa, he relied on human reasoning. He decided not to counsel the Lord and receive his counsel. He didn't decide to ask the Lord what to do with this thing. So he went out and he made, uh, he made an alliance with the enemy. And, and by the way, they were the, in Syria was the enemy of Israel as well as Judah. I mean, they weren't their friends. That's why the enemy of the enemies. He made friend with the enemy of the enemies, my friend, because he bribed him with gold and silver. And the Assyrian king, hey, that's all right with me, man. You want to pay me some bucks and who knows how much that gold and silver was? I'll go down there and kick a few bottoms for you and take care of this for you for whatever you gave him. No deal. See, God doesn't want us to do something wrong to make it right. Never does. He never does. And so he relied on a foreign king to lure the king of Israel away from Judah's borders. So King Asa there, he took his people to remove all of Israel's border building materials. Sounds like border problems we got going on now, doesn't it? And so King Asa built two new border settlements. So he's going to build his own with the material that the other king provided to build the one to keep them out. So like a rat race, doesn't it, what's going on, you see? And see how one thing just leads to another and how it progressively keeps going? See, folks, I mean, you just got to, we got to do it. So God rebukes King Asa. And so God sent the prophet, and he tells the king uh, that he relied on the king of Asia rather than li- relying on the king, uh, uh, rather than relying on the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. And see, when we do, fo- when we do that, folks, we're going to get in trouble. When we do that, we're going to get in a mess. See, when we decide we're going to do it on our own, and we think we can do it our way, and we don't need God's counsel, we don't need God's wisdom, and, and so forth. And the sad thing is, is that Asa had experienced the victories with God before that. Matter of fact, the first 10 years of Asa rule, they lived in total peace and harmony. And actually, this all started out, well, how did they become two different kingdoms? Well, because under King uh, Solomon, you know, which was, uh, you know, okay, and David and Rehoboam, those three, they were one nation. But somewhere in the middle between Rehoboam's reign, they split and became the northern and southern kingdom. And that's how that came about. Okay, and so that, so that puts us kind of like where we're at right now, what's going on. And so the Assyrians' armies had escaped now from Asa's armies. The enemy done to escape from them, went over and then kicked some butt over here, and then, <laughs> and then got out of Dodge right quick. Amen, you see? Uh, we need to do things God's way. Now, you saw what we read there, what had happened when the prophet came and said, Listen, God's upset with you. Because you didn't trust him, you didn't rely on him, you didn't even consult with him uh, in all of this or seek him, and you went about this whole thing wrong, therefore he got cut off from the blessings. Matter of fact, the punishment for him was from here on out, for the rest of his reign, Asa, he reigned 36 years, he would have nothing but wars. Because what he produced was a war with his kinfolk, which they were the northern kingdom. They were Jews, the ten tribes of Israel. So God says, okay, you're going to get just what you did. And for the rest of his reign, there was nothing but wars. 
And so, you, you see, you need to be careful. So, fourthly there, we see God's conclusion on this. King Asa did not rely on God. Let's learn from that tonight. We need to rely on God for everything. Especially if we want the blessings of God and the counsel of God and the leadership of God, then we need to follow His Word, and we need to trust His Word, and we need to rely on Him, even in the days in which we're living. That is, if we want the blessings of God. Because the blessings are going to come through obedience. And the promises are going to come through obedience. And most of them are conditional, just like this was once. In verse 9, you take it from there. God gave King Asa victory over the Ethiopians and over the Lubins, destroying their army. See, that happened in those first years, you see. And, and so he forgot about what God had done for him, you see. And see, that's what happens to us sometimes. We get so blessed, we forget God. We get so blessed that we, we take for granted what we have. And we fail to thank God for it. And then sometimes God allows things to come along and we wonder, well, well what happened to them? The blessing flow kind of stopped. Well, that's the time to do a checkup. Got to check, you see. You notice he said, we'll come back to the perfect here in just a minute, all right, on the perfect heart before God. But then we see that King Asa had previous experience with God's workings, and God checks out the people on the earth searching for those who are loyal to him. God's looking for faithful, dedicated, committed, loyal people to him so that he can show himself strong in your life and in my life so that he can let everybody know that he's God. And not only that, when he does that, you see, church, he's the only one that's going to get the glory. See, we're not going to get the glory when God does it. See, we can't stand up here and blow trumpets and toot horns when God did it all. You see, all the glory and the praise go to him. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to do things in your life and in my life tonight. So, first of all, so he can bless us with blessings untold and, you know, and, 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 and unfathomable, and, and we can't even uh, uh, comprehend or contain them all, you see, so that he can show that God is God. The same way in our lives, in our family, in our marriage, in our church tonight. God wants to bless us. God wants to do some great work amongst us to show that everybody that he's God. And I believe that with all my heart. Then the, then the prophet prophesied the future for Asa. King Asa had done foolishly. And God gave him unending wars for the rest of his reign. Whoa! Here he was in the blessing line and the blessing flow. And God was doing a great work and showing himself mighty and strong. And now, zip. Wow. So, and as a result of that, can you see what he did? King Asa's reaction Notice how he reacted here. King Asa became angry. Matter of fact, he put the prophet in prison. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's getting pretty angry. And the king, uh, uh, and the king didn't like the message, and so he punished the prophet. Oh, boy. So King Asa oppressed others in the meantime. So three years later, King Asa continued to refuse to rely on God, and guess what? He got a foot disease. It was a pretty heavy-duty one. Matter of fact, if you read about it and so forth, most scholars believe that he had probably the most severe uh, case of, of gout that anybody could ever have. That's painful. How many of you ever had gout? Yeah, raise your hand. It's painful, isn't it? I know Carol's had it. Alan's had it. I mean, can you imagine that? And, and all of this simply when God wanted to bless and God wanted to do something great in his life, and, and he wants to do something great in our life, church, and blessings, and so forth. But we'll come back to it. So he refused to give himself to God's mercy. So as a conclusion, King Asa had been a good king for 36 years. Then he stopped asking God for guidance, and King Asa's heart had changed for the worst in his old age. I thought about that for a minute because most of us in here tonight are approaching the silver and golden age. Thinking about his life and what went on. Here he was God's king. Uh, he, was, he was in charge of king over the southern kingdom of Judah, which was the house of David, which where the Lord would come from and, and, and everything. And he had a wonderful privilege and, and opportunity. And, and you would think, as just as you and I ought to think, 
that as we get older and we get into our older age, we ought not let our hearts get bitter and cold and retract. We ought to get even closer to serving the Lord and working for Him and serving Him because you know what we're doing when we get up in our age? We are preparing for eternity. We are preparing for when death will knock at our door. And I don't want to go out like Asa. You see. We want to go out victorious. Serving God because we are. We're preparing for that journey. Yeah, we all want the rapture. Amen. No more than this preacher does. But we may not get the rapture. And keep in mind, God promises his three score and ten. That's seventy. Oh, you see, most of us in here tonight are preparing for the journey. In our preparing, let's go out serving God. Let's go out being faithful, dedicated, committed, and loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ as we meet Him, whether in the air at the rapture or through death now, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We need to go out victorious, serving Christ, living for Him, faithful and loyal. Let's not go out like, and He died that way. He's still a good king, but he wasn't perfect, and he had his problems. But man, we don't want to die and meet the Lord in a defeated life. We want to go out victorious and live for Christ in these last days. If, you know, if everybody lives a normal lifespan, and we're all okay, and when only thing happens to us, as we get up over the 70 mark, we're preparing for eternity. We're preparing to meet the Lord. And so we ought to go out with a bang, you know what I mean? And serving Christ and being loyal and faithful to Him. Let's, let's don't let our heart get changed and become worse in our old age. In our senior years. Amen? Amen. So, I mean, so that just gives you a little rundown of what was going on with this guy and what was happening. And so that's why I gave it to you because you can go and read the story and it's all there for you. And so, but I want to come back to verse 9 of this thing. If what, Read it with me again. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God's looking for men and women to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The word perfect there is where we generally get the word mature, complete. God wants our hearts to be mature and complete towards him in our attitude, in our actions, uh, in our doing, you see, in our motive, and all of that towards Him. And God's looking for men and women that He wants to really show Himself strong in their lives to show that everybody else, He's God. And we're His instruments. We're what He's got to use. May not be the best thing in the world, but hey, we're, we're, God, we're, we're all you got. He's looking for people that are totally surrendered to Him, committed to Him, their heart, in their heart, their heart that is perfect towards Him. And He wants to show Himself strong. And so let's just real quickly, time is almost out already. I can't believe how fast it's gone. Just to give you some examples uh, in the Old Testament where God uh, used uh, men, where men, that their hearts were perfect towards God, and God used that to show the world that He was God. And we can go start with Genesis chapter 6 with Noah. If you read the account of Noah, Noah had a heart that was perfect towards God. Yeah, he had some problems too, but read what the Bible says about his character and his testimony. And God said, build me an ark. What's an ark? Just build it. It's a boat. What's a boat? Never seen one. Why? It's going to rain. And it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. What's rain? Haven't seen any. Don't know what it is. Just do it. And so for 120 years, uh, Noah preached a message of repentance of, to the world to turn that God was going to destroy the world because of their wickedness and their evilness and every imagination of man was rotten that it repented God that even made man and so I'm going to destroy it. But for some of you see the eyes of the Lord was looking for a man and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, and so he built an ark, 
and the God marched all the animals in, and here they came, and he shut the door and sealed it, and all of a sudden the rain started, and the deeps opened up, and the rain was coming up, and all the people were banging on the ark. I want in. Let me in. I want in. I want in. And it was too late, and God showed the world that he was God, and he used Noah to do it. He did a mighty strong in the life of Noah. We move on to the next wonderful example where God took men and and just did a mighty strong work in their lives uh, to, to sow that. We come to Moses, that great leader Moses. You remember the story, right? So we move along from 40 years, now 40 to 80, and God calls him and says, you're going to be the deliverer. I can't speak, I can't talk, I stutter, blah, blah, blah. He's coming up with all kinds of excuses. And God, and if you read the story of Moses and his life, he had a heart towards God, the Scripture says, you see. And God says, I want to do something strong in your life, Moses, to show Pharaoh and all of Egypt that I am God. So you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he goes, and here's the first plague, the plague of blood. Can you imagine getting up tomorrow and brushing your teeth with blood? Can you imagine having your Quaker Oat cereals with blood? Oh, the smell, you know, the stench that you can imagine. And Pharaoh says, I'm not letting them go. I don't know who your God is. I don't believe him going. Then the second plague came was the frogs. You remember the frogs? Now here's my vision of the frogs. They were all over the land. We have little green frogs out here all over the place when it rains. And they croak and make all kinds of noise. So I can see Pharaoh's at night in bed sleeping. Now all of a sudden that uh, bladder begins to move, and he's got to go to the restroom. So I can see old Pharaoh gets up, pulls off his cover, steps out of the bed, squish. What was that? What is happening here? Squish, 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 squish. Oh, my goodness. It's like yogurt and pudding put together. He turns on, the, gets his candle, lights it up. Oh, my goodness, there are frogs jumping all over the place. I don't care. I'm not letting the people go. I don't believe you're God. Well, you know the story got down to the 10th plague. All the firstborn of the land would die if they didn't have the blood over the post. And Pharaoh's own son died. And Pharaoh said, that's it, that's it, get out of here, get out of here, take everything, take take it all, just get out. So they packed up, and there they went. And next thing you know, the children of Israel facing the Red Sea. Here comes, because he's already, uh, Moses was a deliverer already. God did a great work through a man who had a heart after God, a perfect heart towards God. Pharaoh comes up, and there they are, and the walls spark, and there's the kids are going across on dry land. I can just see the kids, as, and, and, God, and, Pharaoh, and Moses said, Lord, what are we going to do? And he said, oh, just stretch out your rod, brother. <laughs> Here goes the Red Sea. Whoop. Whoa. All right, everybody, move. Here they go, singing, dancing, going across on dry ground. I could just see some of the boys, you know, because boys are boys. They walk over to the wall of water. Mother says, come on, we got to go, we got to go. There they go. Pharaoh's army comes up. Pharaoh sends the command, and there they go. God says, that's enough. All the chariots and all the army of Pharaoh died in six inches of water. That's what they try to tell us today. You see? But what did God, and what did all the people back in Egypt said? He's God. We told you, Pharaoh, we told you, Pharaoh. God took a man by the name of Moses on the backside of a wilderness and made him, showed himself strong through Moses because he had a heart perfect towards God. We move along to Elisha. Here's Elijah. There's a problem going on with Ahab. He goes down and tells Ahab, hey, Ahab, not going to rain for three and a half years. I don't care about that. Who said? God said, well, I don't know your God. I don't listen to your God. I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Guess what? The drought came, the famine came, starvation came, death came, everything. Elijah shows up, comes back, so by the way, get ready, it's going to rain. Oh, I heard that, it's not going to rain. Look at it. And he says, matter of fact, he said, Elijah, all this is because of you. It's your fault. And Elijah looked at Ahab and said, no, no, it's your fault because it's your sin and your disobedience to God. But he said, I'll tell you what we do. Let's have a contest. And you know the story. 
You get to 800 prophets of Baal, and you build your altar, and I'll build my altar, and then you pray to your God, and, and we'll, we'll decide the contest by fire. Who's ever God brings fire, that'll be it, right? Okay, so he accepted the challenge, and they did their thing, and nothing happened. They cut themselves, they screamed, they hollered, nothing happened. Then Elijah says, okay, my turn. He says, now before we do anything, go get me some water. I want four bales of water, four barrels of water. Well, they had to go down the Mediterranean Sea to get the water, which is close by Mount Horeb where they were at, okay? They come back and... He goes, go get me four more. Now, I won't do the sound effects on the next four because you got to drift. Get me four more. Twelve barrels of water. Elijah was going to make sure that everything was soaking wet. The sacrifice, the wood, the rocks, and even the ditch around it filled up with water. Because just in case if a little spark sparked up and a little fire, then the people would say, oh, he had a, a match with him. He had a Zippo lighter with him. You know, trick. So, so Elijah walks over and he says, God, let them know who is God this day. And boom. Fire came down, <laughs> licked up the sacrifice, the wood, the rocks, the water, and the people bowed down on the ground and screamed and hollered, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! God did a strong and mighty work in a man called Elijah, which was a man with the same passions that we have. God didn't love Noah or Moses or Elijah any more than He loves you and I today. You can take the story of Joseph, and look what happened with Joseph. Man, beat up, left for dead, lied to his father he was dead, took him out of the hole, <laughs> sold him to slavery, gets slow to Potiphar's, you know all that goes, and ends up from the prison to the palace. He goes from a jailbird to the second man in control who saved Egypt and Pharaoh, and he saved the whole nation of Israel. Why? Because God, because Joseph had a heart that was perfect towards the Lord. And God did a strong work in Joseph's life uh, to show that to, to the nation of Israel and to show Pharaoh and all of them that he is God and there's none like him. The stories are full in here. We can move on. There were three Hebrew children, teenagers, that would not bow, bend, or burn. They refused. And he said, all right, you're going into the fiery furnace. Why? Because those three Hebrew kids, their heart was perfect before, towards the Lord. And God was going to do a mighty work and show King Nebuchadnezzar who was God. Because, see, God can do anything, church. How many of I believe God can do anything? God can do anything, anywhere, anytime He wants to. And He wants to use you and I to show a mighty work, a strong work, that He is God. So you know the penalty. They're going to the fiery furnace. We're not going to bend. We're not going to bow. We're not going to burn, King. Neither the less we go. And there they go, and they heated it up seven times, hotter than ever before. And they threw those three kids in there. They were teenage kids. The mighty captains roasted like you immediately vapor in size, throwing them in there. He lost his mighty men. And all oh, the king couldn't sleep. And boy, he said, hey, call in the magicians, call in the soothsayers, call in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Armstrong uh, uh, calculators guys and everything from Texas. You know, get them in here and the Texas instruments. He said, I'm telling you, did we not cast three men in the fire? Oh, yes, king, absolutely. You absolutely, one, two, three. One, two, three. Two plus one, one plus equals three, three. How is it then I see four in the fire? And one of them is like the Son of God. I'm telling you, he showed and Nebuchadnezzar had to pronounce that the Hebrew children, their God is their God. You see, he did a mighty strong work in three kids, teenagers, because they had a heart, a purpose in their heart, that they had a perfect heart towards the Lord. So we move ahead 70 years, and we come to an old man by the name of Daniel. And Daniel, he was called three times in the book of Daniel, God's beloved. As a matter of fact, Dan, God never said one negative thing about Daniel. Not one thing about him. But Daniel's heart, he prepared when he was a teenager. He said, I purpose in my heart I will not defile myself. And now he's between 80 and 90 years of age. And now we have the king of Persia that doesn't know the Israelis' God, doesn't know who Daniel doesn't know anything. And so he writes a decree, built a relationship with him, finally. 
And now he's going to be thrown into the land of Dian, in the, the, the lion's den, because of the decree. God's getting ready to do a strong work in the life of a senior citizen. Hello, come on, seniors, talk to me tonight, okay? You know, he's somewhere between 80 and 90. Some scholars say he's 80, some say he's 90. I don't care. He's between 80 and 90. He's in his senior years, all right? Jerry's about ready to get there. I right, pretty soon he'll be in the golden age. He's in the golden age, and we're going to move him to the platinum. All right, Amen. Throw him in the den of lions, and the king couldn't sleep all night. Oh, he turned and tossed Darius did, the Persian king, and he rose up early in the morning. Now, now, now think about that for a minute. Somewhere in the back of that king's mind, he had to have some kind of belief in Daniel's God. Because why would he have even got up and ran to that? He knows lions, and he knows what they can do. But no, he couldn't sleep. Boy, he ran over there, oh, Daniel. Is thy God, whom thy serve, is he able to deliver you from the mouth of the lions? And all of a sudden, he probably waited, anticipated to hear that voice. And out come that old senior voice. And Daniel says, oh, king, live forever, for the heaven hurt me. God sent an angel and shut their mouths. And God says, bring him out and throw the other rascals in. And they were eaten up before they hit the ground. Why? And then guess what? Darius also too claimed that God was the Hebrew God of the gods, just as Nebuchadnezzar did. Why? Because God used an old man an old senior who had a heart that was perfect towards the Lord to do a great and mighty work. Now God wants to do the same for you and I. And by the way, if you check all that out, you can't even imagine the blessings that came from all of that. The three Hebrew kids got promoted. Blessings. Daniel got promoted. Blessings. All of them. All of it. Moses. They all. Every, they all. They got the Blessings. Noah got the blessings. Eight members of his family lived. Started all over again. Moses got the blessings as they delivered the children of Israel. Took the spoils of Egypt with them. You see, God blessed them. What does God want to use for you and I tonight? I'm telling you, God wants to use us. God wants to do a strong work in those whose heart is perfect before the Lord. Uh, towards him. So two questions tonight. How about your heart? Is it right with God? Is your heart perfect tonight towards the Lord? You see. Are you willing to serve him and surrender to him and to commit to him? Be dedicated to him and allow him to do something strong? Let's read it again. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. To show himself strong. God wants to show himself that he is God to everybody. And he wants to use you and me, our church, to show himself strong to everybody. In the behalf of them, say, that's me. See, put your name there in your Bible, in that verse. Make it personal. Whose heart, say, God, that's my heart tonight, by your grace, is perfect toward him. Now, God knows you're not perfect. We're all sinners, amen. amen, saved by grace. There's no sinless perfection here. But we can have the right heart attitude and the right motive, and we can have everything we need. We can be dedicated, committed, faithful, and loyal to the Lord, and I believe that's what he's talking about when we have a perfect heart towards God. Because, you see, that's the type of people that God wants to show himself strong in to the world, that he is God. And there is none else. He says so in his word. He says, I am God and there is none else. Another passage he claims that he says, I am God and there's none like me. I love it. And so we tonight, we need to be that person that has that perfect heart, that heart, that attitude, that disposition, that dedication, that commitment, that surrender, that loyalty, so that God can do a strong work in your life and my life. I want to be used of the Lord. I want God to do something great. Nothing wrong with that. He wants to do a strong work, a great work, a mighty work in your life and in my life. That's a good desire to have. But you see, it's conditional. You see, 
if you want that, you got to have the perfect heart. You see? And so what a, a beautiful story. And I, I feel for King Asa that he, he just, poor guy, he messed up. And we don't find any more about him in the story as you read it. He died and buried with his fathers. You know, our time's coming. We want to leave a legacy for Christ, a testimony for Christ. Not that, well, that person changed their heart. He got bitter, cold, and indifferent. He died and was buried with his fathers. I'd rather in these old age said, man, he kept ticking for Jesus. He kept living for Jesus. He kept being faithful, dedicated, committed, loyal as long as he possibly could until Jesus comes in the clouds of glory or he calls us home through death, whichever comes first. And so praise God. Let's not be an Asa in the end. Let's be the best we can for Jesus in the end. And you know what? Let's have that commitment and loyalty and dedication and faithfulness and attitude and, and, and everything and, and in the end towards Christ and all of that towards surrender to Him and serving Him whether we get the blessings or not because He is worthy of it. But we have a guarantee here that if we'll have a perfect heart towards Him, He's going to show and do strong and mighty things in our lives. And with that comes the blessings of God. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for these Old Testament stories, for these passages that are written for our example. The Scripture says they're written for our admonition, for our learning. So, Father, may we learn from Asa tonight in this passage. But may we not forget verse 9, that the eyes of our God is going to and fro on the earth, looking for men and women whose hearts are perfect towards Him, that He might show Himself mighty and strong, that He is God to everyone. And so, Lord, we thank You and we praise You. We bless You. Bless our time now as we go home, Father. Help us to meditate and to sleep on this this evening. Uh, tonight, may the Holy Spirit bring it to our minds and our attentions. And oh my, there are so many other stories and examples that we could use in the Word of God where you did a great, mighty work. And Lord, what's really cool about this, these are just ordinary men. Nothing special about them. Father, you love us and want to do for us just like you did for them. And we just need to have that heart towards you that you've asked us for. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Help us to make that commitment in our hearts, in our minds, tonight as the days go by, that we could be those men and women, young men and women, that God wants to do a strong and mighty work in our lives to show that he is God. Father, thank you. We praise you. We'll ask now for Traveling Mercy's home on the highways. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Bring us here tomorrow to help get some things done and ready for Sunday. And we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And praise the Lord.